Yo, 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 what they do, what they do. I'm your host, Aaron J. Jackson, also known as Marvin Bay. I welcome you to the 43rd episode of the Behind the Beer podcast, presented by the FGO Network. And right here, we got the homie, Nicholas Smalls, man. What's up? What's up? Thank you for having me. No, nah, it's, a, it's an honor that, you know, we're on the show because... You know, even though I'd be back and forth in L.A., we was just, like, always reach out, like, yo, I'm in town. Oh, no, I'm in the other side of town or other side of uh, the country. I was like, damn. So but it's, it's, it's a, uh, actually an honor that I got you here on this uh, show. Um, for the people that don't know who you are, introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Nicholas Small. I'm a photographer and a cinematographer based out of L.A. I grew up here, mm-hmm. um, and then we met, I mm-hmm. guess, through Instagram, right? Yeah, yeah social media and just over the years have kept up mm-hmm. and i spent some time in miami and liberty city and overtown right. working on some photos mm-hmm. and you've been gracious enough to guide me through some yeah. of those areas yeah. um yeah so grateful to be here too thanks most for having me most definitely uh i think i always tell you this every time i see you is uh i I actually got um informed about your work through google images and you're i just typed in right? liberty city i typed in liberty city and i was like yo the way that you document i'm like oh i gotta click this and then turn i followed you and then i reached out and this is how who's this guy yeah in my neighborhood (laughs) how come he did (laughs) most definitely um that's funny so you know you know we in the heart of the pandemic as well uh how did how do you like continue to do what you do during the pandemic or what have you been doing during the pandemic man well, you said, how did I continue to do what I did? I didn't mm-hmm. for a long period of time. And I'm sure yeah. a lot of other people experienced that as well, mm-hmm. where uh, you know, I, I was telling you I work as a camera operator sometimes. Right. That's how I survive. Right. And then I shoot stills on the side, really. Right. You know, but that's a passion of mine, documentary photography. Mm-hmm. Um, but work dried up. All that camera operating work and uh, cinematography work really dried up mm-hmm. just because productions couldn't operate through right. COVID. Right. So I was here with my girlfriend and she's Italian. So mm-hmm. we we're making handmade pasta like every day and giving it to friends. Okay. We thought it would be a lucrative business, but it didn't turn out to be a major success. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but at least you tried. But we tried, <laughs> yeah. And we traveled a little bit. I have some family in Northern California, so... Okay just got to reconnect with family and mm-hmm. and be low-key with friends right i feel like that whole like the even the beginning parts of like the pandemic it was just even though it was like we never seen this before but yeah. it was kind of like in tune you had to be in tune with yourself around that time because it's like i was starting to read books back to back and just you know get try to like force myself to try new things that i've never done and sure you know, have that me time as well too For sure. Yeah. Yeah, I I considered that too. It was a lot of time, you know, we're so used to going. Right. Especially in our industry Mm -hmm. where you have to make everything on your own. You're not clocking in and clocking out. Mm -hmm. So every hour of the day is an opportunity to hustle. Right. And when that work slowed down, it's like, hold on. It made me really look at myself in the mirror and ask, where am I? Where do I want to be? And am I taking those steps to get there? Right. You know? Yeah. So where are you from originally, and how was your upbringing growing up? So I grew up here in Los Angeles, Studio City specifically, Mm -hmm. and I had a great upbringing. My parents are still together. They've been together for over 30 years. Okay. And they've been... That's a blessing. It's a blessing, man. And they are still an example to me Mm -hmm. of what a healthy relationship looks like. Right. I really, really admire both of them. Mm So they provided me and my siblings just a beautiful childhood. Right. And um, and just interesting people on their own. Like, mm-hmm. without being my parents, they're both in the entertainment industry. My dad's a writer mm-hmm. and a director and a producer. And he's recently found a new interest in documentary filmmaking. Okay. And that's something that I do. Mm-hmm. So we're How like, do you feel about that? Because it's like... Your dad is doing that and that and you're about like, well, you're doing that as well. Well, I mean, to be honest, without giving too much credit to myself Mm -hmm. and we haven't really talked about this, but I think that him seeing some of the things that I've done Mm -hmm. have inspired thoughts in him. And and so we've actually gotten to work together on a couple of things. Oh, wow. And yeah, that's a really cool experience. That's 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 very interesting. Like just to see your dad probably on set and just it's crazy. What was your mind like when you just seen that? Um. A couple different things that I would separate it. You know, mm-hmm. I look at him and I respect him as the filmmaker and I'm right. listening to him and 
and you know he's above me right. on set, so I'm right. really just <laughs> respecting him as the authoritative figure. Mm -hmm. But then I have those moments where I'm like, oh my god, here's my dad following his dreams right. at the same time, right. and that's just beautiful to see. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. So cool to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my mom was an actress for a number of years. Wow. So she understands the industry as well. Wow. That's that's very interesting because it's yeah. like your dad and your mom kind of correlate with each other when it comes down to the career. Cause totally. On that side, as a writer, filmmaker, you have to really correlate with the actor or actresses. Like I, I, I start to film certain things and uh -huh. I'll just be like, wow, this is a whole collaboration. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you have one hand washes the other. Literally. Yeah, exactly. It takes a village. Yeah. To make a film or a document, even a music video. That too. Yeah. You know, even yeah. the artists and everything like that. Totally. So, so when did you start picking up a camera? Back to my dad again. He had film cameras mm -hmm. laying around, mm -hmm. and I was always into the mechanics of things growing up. I like right. building things. Mm -hmm. And I just looked at a camera like a piece of machinery. Right. You know, I loved opening it up, loading the film, right. figuring out how the settings right. made the images look different. Right. So I started messing with cameras at like 12 years old. Wow. With film cameras specifically. Mm -hmm. And then in high school, my parents put me in a film developing course over the summer. Right. And that sparked a whole new interest mm -hmm. in the art of developing film and printing it with mm -hmm. an enlarger. So I feel like that's when I started to really fall in love with making images, mm -hmm. but it's been a journey. Yeah. I've fallen out of love with photography at times, and we were talking about yeah. that, you know, and then heavily in love with it, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a whole relationship. Yeah, it's 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 like a relationship with a person, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm in an interesting place with it now, mm -hmm. where I've I've stepped back a little bit. I haven't been shooting as much lately. Right, right. But you know, photography. We don't talk about that. You yeah. know, us as photographers, we don't talk about that as much. I feel like we should talk about that because um, sometimes you, I feel like sometimes you probably feel drained at times. Drained. Yeah. Like I can't make another image. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> like I've clicked too many shutters. Yeah. Way too many. Mm -hmm. And, but I think it's now, especially we see people on social media mm -hmm. and so those are my little dogs. Yeah. And whether they're still shooting mm. or they're stuck in a rut like maybe we are right now. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> it's just us. Sorry. Bella, enough. Hey, no more. Um, yeah, we'll cut that up. Sorry. <laughs> you good, you good. But especially nowadays with social media, whether we're actively shooting or not, right. you can still post old work. Yeah. So you kind of see people like, oh man, they're just on it. Mm -hmm. They're still shooting. They never stopped. Mm -hmm. And it adds a whole other element of pressure, for me at yeah, least, yeah. personally. Me too, me too. And it can be discouraging at times. I do. Where I'm like, damn, why am I not as excited as him or her mm -hmm. to be shooting right now? Mm -hmm. But it could also give you the drive as well, depending on the situation. Yeah, it can at times. Mm -hmm. At mm -hmm. times, it definitely mm -hmm. can. But other times, it can be a little discouraging. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. Because you, you, you see sometimes like, the work that they put out mm -hmm. and you like yo you'd be so amazed but then, then you'd be amazed when you first see it and then you like wow what am i doing like, right. <laughs> right. like what am i doing like i need to go out and shoot but then you don't feel like shooting you know really? at the same time you know yeah i agree with you um so what what do you think kind of like drew you into photography like what was that one thing you were just like damn okay i really want to pursue a good this question well, like I said, I think at first, it was just literally the mechanics of a camera that was right, really interesting right, to me. Right. And then from there, looking at photos I took of my family or my friends, mm -hmm. I felt so much looking at these photos. Right. And there's this one photo I took of my sister when she was a little girl, and I still look at it today, and it's, it's just as powerful. Right. And it's just having that moment and being able to relive that moment for me personally mm -hmm. that is so attractive and so it's just powerful to me yeah growing up i was always the one to like be taking photos of my friends or right. <laughs> videotaping something that i thought would be funny later mm -hmm. and i would go back and watch these videos or look at these photos and relive those moments right. and then eventually as my interest started to expand to like what's in another state or what's in another country right. you know I still go back and look at those photos and relive those memories. Right. 
because it's, it's at the end of the day you just look at it sometimes and just realize that you wasn't in the moment it was just like whatever or whatever right. you're just doing it but then when you look back it's just like i really created a time in my life or created a time in the person's life mm -hmm. like of their memory you sure. know what i'm saying like it's like the little things that matter like even like probably you just loading the film camera mm -hmm. and you know doing that and taking pictures of your sister or whatever the case may be like that that all plays a role yeah yeah but and along that same line being able to share the images with people right. Right. is really powerful as well and seeing right. their reaction i try to share the work that i make with people Right. especially with the people I've made it of. Mm -hmm. Like I've done a series for years now in South Los Angeles with okay. a buddy of mine, McCabe Gregg. Mm -hmm. And we took some of the images back to some of, some of the people, especially some of the elderly people mm -hmm. and the joy that they got calling neighbors over. Look, this is me. This is so-and-so. This is my son with me. Right. That was so incredible to see. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a joyful part of it as well. Mm -hmm. So on the beginning stages of your journey, what photographers would you say got you inspired to, you know, photograph? A lot of street photographers mm -hmm. inspired me and some war photographers. Mm -hmm. One in particular, his name is Eros Hoagland. Oh, wow. And I watched a documentary on HBO called Witness. It's an incredible multi-part documentary about war photographers. I got to check that out. You got to check it out. And Eros did two parts. He did one part in Juarez, Mexico, and one part in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Mm -hmm. And the way that I saw him capture people and capture environments mm -hmm. was very interesting to me. And I had never experienced anything like that. I was pretty sheltered as a kid, mm -hmm. you know, growing up in, in Studio City and parents being together and good family. Mm -hmm. And I became very interested in other parts of the world where people didn't live the same way that I did. Mm -hmm. And I saw this man with a camera exploring that, and I thought, that's exactly what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Regardless of the pay, any of that, right. career, that is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. and the that, passion. Yeah the, the, yeah, the passion for that. And that really set me on a path. So I reached out to him when I was in high school, mm -hmm. and he responded to me, Wow. this guy. And I remember he called me while I was at school, and I ran into the bathroom with a notebook, mm -hmm. and I started taking notes while we were talking on the phone. I said, man, I'm at school. I got to call you back later. So I called him when I got home. And I still talk to him today. He's oh, been a major wow. mentor in my life. Yeah. Any big decisions, I always talk to him. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I am with my mentor. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I actually interviewed uh, one of my mentors, Jeffrey Salters. And cool. he's just for Sports Illustrated, a lot of sports okay. photography. And just like how I met him and just actually sitting down with him and just him just talking about certain things that you know about how he photographed certain things and how he came up and everything like that so it's just like that's kind of like the similarities that's of really like, interesting yeah like it's just crazy and it's that little moment like <laughs> you probably learned tons of stuff that you didn't know before from talking to him like right this. right even conversations like conversations yeah. get inspiring because it's like you start to understand the other people's viewpoints of how they photograph or how they just view things on life sure as well too um but yeah man that's i feel like war photography don't get enough credit mm -hmm. because it's like and this is from the outside looking in is because you have to understand that with war photography they was in the war so yeah. anything could like happen right. and that goes back into what we talked about earlier off the air like photography is just like one of the type of situations that you don't even think about what's around you just look in the viewfinder and just <laughs> and just look forward, yeah. you know. Yeah, and some people use that as a as like a safety blanket or a crutch, right? Kind of mm -hmm. to ignore what's happening around them. Mm -hmm. Therapeutic. And yeah, yeah, and feel safe to just close one eye and the other eye is just, like you said, just seeing through the lens. So, do you think um, with his work, <laughs> it kind of correlated into what you got going on now and how you photograph certain subjects and uh, the different areas that you go into? It definitely inspired a curiosity in cultures that I'm not familiar with. Right. And, and to be totally honest, there was an attraction to putting myself in maybe some dangerous situations. Yeah. Like, just point blank. Seeing him in those situations, I was curious to see what I would feel like in a situation like that. Right. And not that I've really been in a war zone even, but um, 
just some of the areas I've chosen to go into, I've been curious to see how I would personally react and deal with those situations. Right. Um, yeah, and that's been kind of a, a weird conversation I have with myself because mm-hmm. when I started college, I wanted to study history and international relations, learn about the world, mm-hmm. and then I wanted to go work as a war photographer. Oh, wow. And you know, actually, my mentor, uh, Jeffrey Salter, he actually uh, used to shoot for the Army. Really? Yeah. Did I got, travel I got, with I, them? Yeah, he okay. uh, went overseas and everything. I got I to gotta, uh, yeah, you at gotta, least link you guys please. or just everything. But sorry to interrupt. Or even just to see his work. I would love yeah. to see his work. Yeah. Um, what you were saying though. but yeah yeah so i thought i thought i would i would go pursue that and then i found an interest in camera operating and cinematography and that led me into a career in the film industry mm-hmm. so let's i don't talk know about that let's talk about that like yeah. how did you i know you said earlier about your father being mm-hmm. into it but how did you like really decide that you want to get into cinematography because that's a whole it's similar but it's a whole different world as it well, is too. different it is different yeah, I never thought I'd work in the film industry. Mm-hmm. I think seeing both of my parents in it, I just mm-hmm. wanted to do something different. Mm-hmm. And growing up, I was on set. I went and worked as a production assistant since right. I was like 14 years old mm-hmm. just to make some money. Uh, but I, people would ask me, so what are you going to do here? What are you going to do on set when you're older? Mm-hmm. Nothing. I'm out of here. Mm-hmm. I'm not doing this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just wanted to do something different, you right. know? Right. And um, while I was in New York, I met a guy named Vladimir Gomez, okay. a skateboarder. Mm-hmm. A really fascinating young guy and he's went on to do some really incredible things he started a company called public housing skate team mm-hmm. clothing company and uh just a multimedia brand mm-hmm. with his partner ron and he had a fascinating story right. and it just aligned at the time where i was ready to tell try and tell that story mm-hmm. and i took my canon 7d and i flipped it over to video mode and i started recording some clips i did an interview with him mm-hmm. I cut together a terrible short documentary mm-hmm. on him, <laughs> so bad. Mm-hmm. But um, he was great. Like, and and I fell in. I found found a new love mm-hmm. for making images. But now they're moving images. Mm-hmm. And I thought, all right, let me go back to LA, use some of these contacts in the film industry right. to learn how to tell these stories better. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I'll, it'll be stills that'll serve the story best, and sometimes it'll be video. Yeah. yeah. Um, and as I became proficient in shooting video then i was hired to do different things work on documentaries music videos right um television shows and so what gets you like kind of motivated in the cinematography world because when i look at cinematography i look at the lighting the mm-hmm. lighting of everything it just brings it catches my eye to yeah feel this. well yeah i i found myself in certain still photo situations mm-hmm. Um, wanting to make modifications mm. that I would think I thought would tell the story better, you know, light it differently, put someone in a different area. Mm. But I felt weird doing that because I was in maybe a difficult situation with someone right. and right. it just didn't feel right. It didn't feel real or authentic to change it that much. Right. But I still had the desire to tell stories in that way where I could control everything. Mm. So that's where, um, maybe on a documentary series and you're interviewing someone, you have the opportunity to think mm-hmm. what is going to serve him or her best right. story wise. Right. Where do I want to put them? How do I want to light them? Mm-hmm. And there's just more options, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. some creative control there. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So what, going back to photography, what was your first camera? First camera was a Nikon. I think it was called an F2020. I still have it upstairs. Wow. And that was my dad's film camera. Wow that he handed down to me, mm-hmm. not officially, I kind of just took it and started mm-hmm. using it, mm-hmm. but he's cooled it. So that was the first one. And then I probably had an AE1, a Canon AE1 Man. somewhere in there. <laughs> I interviewed uh, some <laughs> photographers as well. Their first, uh, one of their first cameras was a Canon AE1. I used to have a Canon AE1. It's a AE1. classic I starter. It. Yeah. I, I regret to this day, <laughs> I sold it. Like, I've got one of those up there. And then a Pentax K1000. I got that one. That's a great That's a, camera. Yeah, I have to keep. I won't Simple, get that one. The light meter is just that little needle. Mm-hmm. I can move fast with that camera. Yeah, on the go, whatever. On the go. Be. And then eventually I bought my dream film camera, like an M6. Yes. Oh, man. That's, yeah. that's, that, that's that baby. That's the baby. <laughs> yeah. So that's the one that I probably shoot the most on. But sometimes I miss the Pentax and I got to yeah. go back. That's how I'm feeling right now. Yeah. Like, 
I, I, I like I had put my Pentax K1000 away, like in my storage, because I shoot medium format with uh, my uh, with a Pentax 645. Nice. And you know you get comfortable with the with the with the medium formats and everything, but then something tells you like you need to go back to the 35. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I'm at that stage right now, going back to the Pentax K1000 and just go out and just. You know, they shoot. feel different, yes. the, two, the different mediums, mm-hmm. right? Like 35 millimeter to me ends up feeling more personal. Yes. And um, and one, shooting 120 or mm-hmm. 220 medium format, I like to use more for like landscapes or right. for like a beautiful portrait of someone. Right, right. But I don't know. I agree. I'm still figuring that out. Yeah. 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 I'm, yeah. I, I totally agree. It's just agree. tools. Yeah. Right? We, we, they do different things. Yes. Yes. That's 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 the with the photography aspect of everything. The camera is really the tools. Yeah. To, it's like a mechanic. You get in your wrench. You get in. Yep. Um. Your your uh, all the other different tools. Nuts and to, bolts and yeah, all whatever. that and it's everything like that. So that's how I apply it as well to like when it comes down to uh, the cameras and the mm-hmm. photography stuff like that because everything do different things for just one purpose. As right. Well too. Um, what was your first shoot, if you could recall? My first like official yeah. shoot? Mm-hmm. I know exactly what it was. I was actually thinking about this the other day because mm-hmm. it's so cringy. It was um, a guy I met on the street. I had my camera with me, and he said, do you do headshots? Mm-hmm. Aspiring actor in L.A., right? I said, yeah, I do headshots, of course. <laughs> yeah. I didn't do headshots. Right. And he said, okay, how much do you charge? said, so, oh, we'll work something out because I had no <laughs> idea what to charge. And I took his number down, told him to meet me at this park. And my dad came with me. He's like, I got to see if this guy's, you know, not trying yeah. to kidnap you. Right. And uh, I had my dad hold the balance for me. I shot some headshots of the guy. Mm-hmm. I think he probably paid me like $50. Mm-hmm. And that was my first shoot. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's, that's that's amazing. And yeah. The fact that your dad is, uh, again, is there to just He's like, there, man. So supportive yeah. and interested. Aside from just your classic support, right? He's interested in what me and all my siblings have done growing up. It's been the biggest gift mm-hmm. ever. Right. So, what would you say has to be, or what was your first big opportunity in your perspective that you got as a photographer? As a photographer, I created that opportunity for myself. Right. I drove down to South Los Angeles with a camera that my aunt um, lent to me. It was a Mamiya RZ67 Pro 2. Mm-hmm. Since then I've bought it from her, but she lent me that camera and I went down to South Los Angeles and started introducing myself to people who I felt I could connect with. Right. I grew up in LA and the only things I had heard about this place, you know, South Central mm-hmm. were negative. I see cop chases on the news or someone's shot and dead or something terrible. And I just, for whatever reason, I think I was listening to a lot of Kendrick Lamar at the time. Mm -hmm. I felt really compelled to go learn about that part of my city. Mm -hmm. And going going down there over the last five years, and it's slowed down in the last couple of years, but... I learned so much about myself. I learned how I like to photograph people. I learned how I like to communicate with people Mm -hmm. and gather information Mm -hmm. and record information about people. So that was the biggest opportunity anyone ever gave to me in in the world of photography. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud to say I gave it to myself. Right. Right. And then as far as uh, my career in the film industry, a buddy of mine, Daniel Karp, was working for a production company and a music management company Mm -hmm. and they managed some pop artists and there was an opportunity to bring a camera operator in and he said don't fuck it up (laughs) but go for it yeah don't blow this keep everything sharp clean movements and man i was i was on it Mm -hmm. i was on my shit and since then he referred me again and then other people saw my work and that was the beginning of my real career as an operator wow like my mentor jeffrey he says Cause I asked him, I'm like, do you ever look back at your work and just be like, wow, let's go based on what we talked about yeah. here. And mind you, he's a, a 50 year, 50 plus year old guy. And he's like, no, I mean, every once in a while I'll be like, wow, 
But then, you know, he tells me, you're only good at your last word. That's right. <laughs> so, that's right. <laughs> so it's just like you got to keep on going and going and going. I know. And yeah. that's part of the hustle that I really hate mm-hmm. about the industry, the creative industries of, you know, freelance photography and cinematography. Yeah. Because it's mentally exhausting to always be proving yourself. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Facts. The facts is... A lot of people don't talk about that, you know, as, yeah. as a photographer, you know, dealing with even the anxiety aspect of everything. Like, even doing the shoots, like, right. we're thinking, like, how can we get this done? <laughs> and I hope when I send these files <laughs> yeah. to the company, it's they a like good every response. single one. Yeah. yeah. It's like, once you press send, it's like... Uh, yeah, that could be it with those yeah, people. Yeah. I know. I think the same thing. Mm-hmm. And that goes for other careers in creative industries like my girlfriend's a dancer and a, and a choreographer mm-hmm. and now a creative director but it's the exact same thing if she shows up and the artist doesn't like the movements that she put on the artist or the dancers that could be it for her with that artist for the mm-hmm. rest of time mm-hmm. and so i'm so lucky to have her to relate on that level right and to talk about those things right and that goes to my next question like um, what do you think is the biggest challenges you can face as a photographer? Um, biggest challenges. And how do you overcome it as well, too? Well, overcoming yourself mm-hmm. is one, and I haven't mastered that yet because mm-hmm. I can be really critical of myself. Right. And, you know, you finish a shoot and you look at the images you made and, oh, these are garbage. <laughs> So-and-so's not, never going to hire me again. Or, n- right. Forget that. They're just not going to like them. And that's embarrassing, you know? Mm-hmm. And so you, you worry yourself with that. But then the the monetary aspect of it that you have to overcome, which is it's really hard to make a name for yourself to right. where you're actually earning money that you can survive on. And so overcoming both of those things, I don't think I have overcome either of those things Mm -hmm. you know because i don't work full-time as a still Mm -hmm. photographer it's an ongoing thing yeah but i guess in a sense that is overcoming it Mm -hmm. i've figured out a way to still make photos and Mm -hmm. survive right and i like some of the photos i've made so Mm -hmm. that makes me feel successful right right (laughs) so how would you describe your style of work my style of work i mean it's straight up documentary photography Mm -hmm. like i go and I go after subjects and stories that I find interesting Mm -hmm. and I create images that I think tell the story Mm -hmm. um, authentically. Right. Yeah. That's what I try to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's something more specific that you want out of that. No, (laughs) no. I I, I agree. Um, I feel like it's very documentary and I think that's why it intrigued me into looking at your work and every time I look at your work, on your website as well too it just it's the way that you capture the 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 subjects in their element mm. um just like this one portrait you took of one of my friends um um reggie Reginald. reggie and um the fact that you capture him and his element because not some people really capture him mm. while he's painting or when he's in his area or whatever the case may be oh he let me in yeah so yeah so it's just like knowing me, knowing him, and knowing where he come from. It's like you know, it's a story behind mm-hmm. that, you mm-hmm. know. And he's one of many people that comes from our community and stuff like that. And um, and also um, one of my good friends that you documented too. I was there actually, um, fellow boy, him yeah. and his mom, and yeah. um, and Overtown and everything like that. I love that image. Yeah, like. I look at that from time to time. <laughs> that just hits me for me some too, reason. Me too. Him and his mother. Yeah, like and and like I said, like it falls back into memories. We could have these conversations based on what we mm-hmm. the, 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 what transpired in that shoot earlier that day. <laughs> you know, we could tell that story because when we look at that portrait, it's if like, he's cool with it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. So, um, I recently just seen that um, you went to Minnesota during the whole George Floyd situation. Yeah. How was that like, documenting the whole you know, atmosphere um, during that time? Well, before I talk about that, I just wanted to mention one more thing. Mm-hmm. I have to give the credit. You know, you're saying that I've done a good job or whatever you said about documenting these people in their environment. I have to give the credit to those subjects for allowing me in mm-hmm. because without their trust 
and they're it's all about trust. comfort. Mm-hmm. I don't make a good image, mm-hmm. you know, and some of that's on me to create that trust. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, I have to give it to them for trusting me. And right. even with fellow boy and his mother, he could have said, I'm not taking a photo with my mom. I don't even know you, Yeah, yeah. you know, so that's thank you to anyone I've ever photographed who's allowed me in. Right. Um, yeah, good question. Mm-hmm. But fellow boy or um, Ferguson, what was it? Um, about the George Floyd situation when George you Floyd. was around that atmosphere around that time. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I saw uh I saw that city imploding mm-hmm. on the news. Right. Buildings were on fire and this was fought a few days after George Floyd was murdered by that police officer. Um I immediately felt compelled to go and be a part of telling that story. It just it felt like a really powerful moment in our country. Mm-hmm. And I I wanted to document that right. for whatever reason. I didn't care to have it published right away or anything like that, but I felt like that was an important thing to cover. So I booked a flight and rented a car and found myself wow. down there within two days. And again, thank you to my girlfriend for being so supportive because I was sitting here looking at the news and looking at flights and she looked at me and said, you got to go. You have wow. to go. Wow. And without that support in that moment, I may have hesitated and, and not gone. Um, I, I thought, honestly, I thought it was a publication that, that was like, It eventually did get published okay. uh, through a couple people. One is The, the Point magazine. Mm-hmm. Really cool magazine. I can show it to you later. But it was powerful being there. It was a lot of energy. So they shut down the intersection where, where George Floyd was actually murdered. Oh, wow. And the community and people from all over the country actually showed up and took that area over like a couple square blocks. They didn't allow police in. Uh, They really tried to control that area. And there were people cooking food, barbecuing, playing music, praying for him and his family. Uh, It was an emotional space, Mm -hmm. you know, and I found myself taking less photos than I normally do. And just absorbing what was happening. Oh, yeah, it was yeah. Inter- it was really interesting. I just put my camera down a bunch of times and talked to people and looked around and tried to experience what was actually happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a cool experience. Yeah. Me, it's kind of similar around that time in Miami. Um, they had a protest as well, too. And I was, it's like I was in the middle. Of, it goes back to the war photography. Um, right. Where you, the aspect you told me about that. Like, I was in the middle when they were throwing, like, you know, throwing, like, Oh, stuff. they were messing around. Yeah, like. I don't know if you had the National Guard out there. Yes, we did. Yeah. Like, I seen, like, all them on the roof and everything like that. And mind you, they throwing rubber bullets. So, mind you, we have a camera. I have a camera in my hand. So, that could be misconstrued as a gun. For sure. So, I'm, like, in the middle of everything throwing it. But I'm, like, I got to. I got to document I gotta this be history. Here. This yeah. is history. So Especially I, in your town. I'm yeah, sure you felt a yeah. responsibility. Exactly. To like, be there. I didn't care. Just like I said, yo, I, I got to go. Yeah. Like, I didn't care. Like, I was like, it was the heart of Corona. A lot of people forget about that. Like, yeah. And yeah, you're like, right. <laughs> I even forgot about that. Yeah, like, I didn't care about none of that. I had to, like, document that because it's, like, a history and time that we're going to, like, when we look back at these pictures or documentation, we're going to be like, wow, we really survived right. that. Like, but that's the weird part of photography. Like, so what? What's the point? Right. I ask myself that all the time. Right. What is the point of me going and making those photos? There are plenty of other people who work for the New York Times and Time Magazine out there taking the images. Right. right. And then that's where it feels selfish sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't really need to be there, do I? Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's something I ask myself. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, you know, I think about that too because sometimes you have to really push yourself to do it. Yeah. It's like your, your girl told you like, Gave you the courage to, for sure, you know, to do it. Yeah. And sometimes you, it's, it's kind of hard to push yourself. He's like, uh, because you can think of the reasons not to. Right. Right. Sometimes right. more easily than the reasons to. Right. But yeah, that was that was a really powerful uh, couple weeks, mm-hmm. ten days, whatever it was. And I met some amazing photographers out there. Okay. Some photojournalists who worked for these big publications. And that was a really inter- interesting experience as well. Mm-hmm. Seeing how they cover situations. Seeing when they get nervous and how they deal with those wow. those moments. You wouldn't even think they get nervous because they're so used to, you know. But w- watching when they decide, okay, it's time to leave. Mm-hmm. That was very interesting. Mm-hmm. 
and I wasn't as equipped as they were. I didn't have a helmet. I didn't have a flak jacket. Um, I didn't have uh, bulletproof glasses. Those were all things I should have had. Wow. Because I actually did get hit with um, a rubber bullet. It was a uh, it was some projectile that had like a peppery, like a mace. Oh yeah. In it. Yeah. I forget what they call them. It's like a pepper ball, yeah, essentially, yeah. but it's a about. foam that explodes, and it broke my skin. So then those chemicals got in my, I think, into my bloodstream, mm. and my whole body was on fire for like twelve hours. Wow. Yeah. I got when I was in Miami with doing the riots. I got uh, you know when they throw the um, what's the thing called uh, tear gas. Tear gas. Yeah. It got all in my eyes. That's in terrible. My mouth, yeah. And I couldn't. Feel like you can't breathe. Yo, like <laughs> eyes are watering. <laughs> Luckily, we had people around for that. Like they had like uh, milk, yeah, and um, water. Protest and, medics, man. Like, yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a story. It's, it's a. It it's starts a, to feel like what a war zone would feel like. Exactly, and that's why I said like it's kind of like in that moment when I left, <laughs> I was just like, wow, I can understand what a war photographer. I can only imagine what a war photographer goes through right. in those moments, and like, what is, what is that person thinking? Could only time? imagine. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So what what would you say is your favorite place to travel to when it comes down to just documenting overall a period? Of Miami. Time? Yeah. Hundred percent. I need you, to be there more often. You think so? I think so. <laughs> no, I know so. Yeah. The the people, the uh, the language. <laughs> like the words you guys use yeah. that I've never heard before are so, I don't know, it's just rich in culture and right. it feels good to be around. The right. food's good. Lemon yeah. pepper, I don't forget. <laughs> hey, yeah, lemon pepper. Shout, I, shout out to lemon pepper. I crave it all the time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I, th- I think about that restaurant all the time. Yeah, man. I had some, um, now they they selling salad, like grilled uh, grilled fish salad. So I, 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 I Conch? I, yeah. No, they have conch there too. Conch. I ain't have conch How do you pronounce it? Conch. Conch. <laughs> conch. Yeah. yeah, they don't have it out here. No, they don't. Not. Right? Damn. <laughs> definitely like, not. So I'm, that's the southern, you know, or South Florida. That's what we known for for the conch because you know the yeah. Caribbean and everything yeah. like that. But it's it's so crazy. It's so crazy because when you travel, you just see different aspects of different things with foods and stuff like that. I love the weather. Yeah, it's hot every the day. The colors, the pastel <laughs> Very colors, vibrant. vibrant mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's what I mean. The culture in every aspect is rich and mm-hmm. vibrant. Mm-hmm. It's just it's fun to be around. It's interesting. Yes. I'm, I'm totally drawn to it. And I think there's a lot of interesting change happening in Miami. It is right with water levels rising mm-hmm. and on what Miami was Beach. once a desirable area mm-hmm. along the water is now kind of uh, a risk to live there and to invest in right. for developers. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's a coincidence. It's not a coincidence, I should say, that these developers are starting to invest more money into the inner city mm-hmm. and stray away from those beach lines. But it's at the expense of people who have lived there, mm-hmm. with yeah, with with little to no opportunity for decades, mm-hmm. if not a century. Right. And especially Miami, or the way that everything's structured, it's like it's like you got the beach. Then you got the the, uh, the causeway, and then you got the city areas. And when it comes down to that, when it rains, like like when it rains bad, you start to see flooding everywhere. Like, really? Like literally, like you go to Brickell or certain parts down south, like it rains bad, like Interesting. flooding. Like when doing hurricanes, we are like last few hurricanes, we had it really bad. Hmm. Like you know, depending on what areas, like sometimes, like especially the beach, the beach got it worse. Like when it rains bad and we have a hurricane or a tropical storm, the water will literally be like high. Wow. And then the water will get in people's cars and stuff like that. So it's it's you know, that's crazy. Like global warming. You know, that's that's, yeah. that's that's crazy. And even like uh I saw this like little uh, YouTube video um on Miami Beach. It's certain areas that they obviously like they built like they fixed the roads so it could be mm-hmm. a little bit higher. But then you got state roads that's taken forever through Tallahassee, which is the capital, to approve hmm. to get those roads done. So it's just like, but Miami, that's Miami. <laughs> you yeah, know? I just, I think it's important that people pay attention to how development exactly. changes over time and, exactly. and who it affects. Exactly. Um, you know, seeing 
and um, seeing just even seeing like people I grew up with not living there no more. They moving either up north or down south, and it's kind of like damn, like this is really changing. Or just seeing certain houses that was abandoned or you uh it was you know different activity going on right mm-hmm. there but you just see it every day and now you're just seeing a new house pop up it was like right wow so you, you know you know it's it's uh very interesting you know just it seeing is. that in miami but you know it's just, it is what it is that's just how you know that's how yeah. people, are, people approach it yeah yeah and that's it's easy for people to just say it is what it is mm-hmm. yeah and um it's overwhelming because right. it's it's such a big thing to tackle. Right. How are you going to stop developers or the government from changing these neighborhoods if right. that's what they plan to do? Right. And it's not so much that and you're going to... St- and the resources. The resources. And it's not so much that you're going to stop them, mm-hmm. but at least people should be aware of what they're doing. Right. And who it's affecting. Right. Yeah. So jumping back into photography, I, I know this is going to be a hard question. That's all right. Go for it. <laughs> Um, what, what would you say so far has to be one of your favorite photographs? Favorite photographs. Uh, there's a woman named Estella who lives in Watts. Okay. And so not as hard as you thought it'd be. <laughs> that is my favorite <laughs> photograph. I have it actually printed over here somewhere. I can mm-hmm. show you at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, she was in her mid eighties at the time that we took the photograph, me and my yeah. buddy McCabe Gregg. And she just had the most... Uh, kind of classic and historical story Mm -hmm. that reflects that community so well. Mm -hmm. She grew up in Louisiana, migrated north to Los Angeles Mm -hmm. uh, when she was young with her husband or boyfriend at the time. And they were in search of work. They came to Los Angeles, had kids who had grandkids who had grandkids. And they've seen it all. You know, she's got kids or grandkids, sorry, um, who were in gangs and have ended up in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And she's just a, she's a perfect reflection of a beautiful woman who came, who who moved North in search of opportunity and who experienced the good and the bad, right? There was opportunity, but living in an area that became a ghetto Mm -hmm. quote unquote Mm -hmm. kind of destroyed some of her family. Mm -hmm. So she's just, she's a fascinating woman with a really interesting story. And she's a woman of faith. She's a woman of God. Mm-hmm. And she was wearing a, a bracelet that said, try God. And there's an American flag in the background. Mm-hmm. So I just, I feel like that photo tells the story well. And so I'm proud of that photo. It's crazy because uh, the photographers I interviewed in the past, just, they have a tough time just, you know, uh, uh, expressing what's their favorite because so many of them. yeah so many I'm trying to take myself less seriously these days also right. you know I could have sat here like two years ago like oh man I don't know there's so many great photographs mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. no I that I like that photo a lot mm-hmm. so that's mm-hmm. the one so now this is probably going to be another hard question um well th- this might probably prove me wrong <laughs> film or digital and why uh they they both serve their own purposes mm-hmm. personally if i'm shooting something i really care about it's it's going to be on film right <laughs> because the digital sensor is evolving forever and the look of a digital image will continue to to change All right. so i don't like taking the risk of it looking good today and then in 20 years people's eyes have changed because mm-hmm. the sensors have changed mm-hmm. and it's wow he must have taken that back in you know 2021 mm-hmm. <laughs> film oh yeah yeah he shot that on yeah. his like a yeah and it's 35 millimeter and it's timeless mm-hmm. you know yeah, it's definitely timeless like so if i care about it better believe it's getting developed <laughs> oh most definitely yeah it's just something about film it's like it was make it, film is just like it gives you that that rawness mm-hmm. that rawness that <laughs> you can't even put in words at all like films forever yeah like it's forever what would you uh, say, you know, you probably play with many different cameras. What would you say has to be your favorite camera of all time? Of all time? Mm-hmm. Hmm. I would say the Pentax K1000. Mm-hmm. I think that's just a great, versatile 35 millimeter camera that I've made some really cool images with. Mm-hmm. Images that I feel good about and yeah, just easy to work. Total workhorse. Yeah. 
But in the last few years, I've really fallen in love with that like M6. Yeah, I got a that I works well too. Day, yeah. Um. So when we get in a photography book by Nicholas, like man, smallest. it will happen someday. <laughs> That's where I still take myself a little too seriously. Yeah. And I also just downplay myself. I'm like, man, right. you don't deserve to have a book out. Yeah. Like yeah. you're so not there. Yeah. But someday I'll put a book out. That project I've mentioned now a couple times in South Los Angeles mm -hmm. has been a real passionate project for me and McCabe. And that's something we always intended to publish as a book. Right. So it's it's really just a matter of time before we feel like there's enough of a, a wholesome story right. that's digestible for people. I don't want to just put out a bunch of images of people. Mm -hmm. um, I want their to be a story that people can process. It's going to do something for people, you know? Right, right. I want it to do something for people. So, yeah, maybe in the next five years, mm -hmm. that book will come out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can't wait. Um, so, last question. Any advice for anybody that uh, wants to take the similar path that you did hmm. and that want to continue to do what they do? <sighs> Don't look at too many people's work. Yeah. Just, just focus on what you care about. Because it's difficult, it's more difficult to figure out what you care about than you think. Mm -hmm. What you really care about, the stories you really want to tell, mm -hmm. the style that you want to represent in your work. Follow your own path. Trust yourself. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Trust yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't stress too much. <laughs> Just yeah. be, and stay excited about it. Figure out ways to stay excited about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. So episode 43 i appreciate you man congrats how can the people Thanks get in for contact having with you uh instagram nicholas e small mm -hmm. is a good way i try and respond to anyone who ever dms me mm -hmm. um my email and small photo at gmail.com mm -hmm. website nicholas mm -hmm. yeah those are good ways yeah well that's it i appreciate you again cool like, thank really you so do. much for having me really this was a blast it's, it's, it's been a it's been a long time coming man yeah and absolutely we, we finally here all right i might have to interview you next let's go <laughs> <laughs> you never know let's let's get to it cool so this is episode 43 and we out